Hello, hello. It's Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining us today. We are here with Nate from Cali Audio, and he's one of my favorite people to talk to about all things monitors. He's been a monitors pro who's been living, breathing, eating monitors for more than a decade, and he knows a lot about uh, about the stuff and a lot about communicating it as well. So, Nate, really excited to have you here on the channel. Thanks so much. And our big topic for today is going to be about subwoofers. Do you need a subwoofer? What are the benefits to having a subwoofer? Could subwoofers lead you astray and actually make things worse for you? Do you need a certain size room to have a subwoofer? Like how big of a space do you need for one to be in there? What kind of size of subwoofer do you need? There's different sizes that Cali offer and that other monitor companies offer. We'll also talk a little bit about setting it up. What does that process look like? How hard is it? And should you be saving up money to buy nicer speakers or is it better to get less expensive speakers plus a sub? All of those questions are ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. And if you guys have more questions, we'll be answering your questions live here in the chat. So if you want clarification on anything in here, just type it in in real time and I'll be looking through your questions whenever Nate is answering here. So let's get right into it. And let's start with the first and most obvious question, which is what are the benefits of having a sub, Nate? And maybe if you can add on to that, who are some prime candidates who might benefit from a subwoofer in your studio? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take a step away from my role as someone who manufactures subs and wants to sell them to you for a living for a <laughs> sec and say that, um, you know, if you're making records and especially if you're not doing so as a, if that is not your professional full-time job, you might not need a subwoofer. Um, and what it comes down to is really a question of workflow. Um, the purpose of a subwoofer in your recording studio is so that you can hear all the low end in the range of human hearing down to about 20 hertz. Um, and uh, you can do that with headphones. Um, and you should do that with headphones. You should always double check your mix on a pair of trusted headphones so you know exactly what's going on in the low end. Um, in terms of workflow, is it fun and easy to do that on headphones? And especially if you're mixing a really bass heavy genre um, or if you're mixing something like film content that has a lot of really low bass content all the time, not just one little hit here or there. Um, you don't want to live on headphones. It's uncomfortable. It's not really giving you a, a realistic picture of your mix. Um, you certainly don't want to be mixing on headphones for eight hours at a, at a time. Um, and so in that case, yes, having a sub is really nice because it gives you the complete picture of the mix um, and it integrates nicely into your workflow. But in terms of like, can I make a record without a subwoofer in the room? Absolutely. Um, and do I need a subwoofer before I can get started mixing things like EDM and hip hop? No, you don't. You can use a pair of headphones and you're going to be fine. Um, I think eventually you'll find that it would be nicer to not rely on the headphones so much. And so you're going to want to get a subwoofer. Yeah. All that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> now, my next question to piggyback on this would be, are there certain cases where subwoofers could actually be a detriment where you don't need all that low information or are there certain types of rooms or setups where they don't make sense? So one of the first questions that we got in, maybe you can speak to this, Chris uh, was asking, I'm in the market for monitors, but my bedroom is probably too small for subs. What are your thoughts there? Is there a certain room size that you need or if at a certain room size, you need a certain size sub? What are your thoughts there? Yeah. So I'm going to split that into two things. At some point, there came about this notion that is still pretty popular, um, that there's some sort of relation between room size and the size of a woofer that uh, play with each other somehow, and that certain rooms could be too small for certain size of woofer and that they would overwhelm the room. Um, that is, that's a half truth at best. Um, there's a phenomenon called room gain, which is basically when you put any speaker in a room that isn't an anechoic chamber, the walls, the ceiling, the floor are all reinforcing the low end. Um, and as you put a speaker closer to one of those boundaries, it's reinforcing the low end more. Um, and so if you've got those boundaries sort of close to each other, you can get a lot of low end buildup. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have a subwoofer in that room, or that doesn't mean you shouldn't have large speakers in that room. Um, there are things that you can do in terms of the placement of your monitors and your subwoofer to control that low end. There are things that you can do in terms of 
the level that you listen to um, so that you're not uh, overwhelming the room with bass. Um, but there's really, I mean, if, if it's a large enough room for you and the speakers and the subwoofer to fit, there's no acoustical reason not to have a subwoofer in there. Um, where I think you can run into problems, subs are really fun and it's really fun to like turn up the bass um, and suddenly your mixes sound a lot better because you have 10 dB more bass in them. Um, and it's really easy to run into a problem where your mix sounds fantastic in the room because you've got all this subwoofer energy and then you translate it anywhere else where you don't have this is overwhelming amount of energy on the low end and you're like where is my bass it sounded so cool in my room um that has nothing to do with the size of your room um i mean it does because you know you get more room gain in a smaller room but you can have a room that plays well with your sub that is very small you can have a room that plays poorly with your sub that is very large um and when you're going about setting up that's really the most important thing is figuring out your listening position relative to the subwoofer. Um, there's a trick that has been around for ages where you put your subwoofer in your chair and you crawl around the floor until the subwoofer sounds right. Um, mm. And that relationship is exactly what you need. So you put the sub on the floor where it sounded right and obviously you'll be sitting in your chair um, and you'll have a really nice uh, balance of the low end. And then it's just important to check that mix. Again, trusted pair of headphones um, when you're dialing in the level of your subwoofer relative to the level of your mains, make sure that you don't have too much or too little because that's going to have a huge impact on translation. Yeah. Amazing. You know, I, I hadn't actually heard of that. Before. <coughs> One of the things that I had heard was almost the inverse of that, of trying to put your sub in as many places as possible until it sounds the worst and you feel like you've lost all the low end and then flip the polarity of your sub and now it's in an ideal spot. But one of the possible issues there is that maybe then the sub would be over amplified, um, I suppose. But you're talking about sitting it literally in your chair where you would sit in your exact sitting spot, crawling around, finding where it sounds best. And a question there is, how do you know what sounds best in that context? Um, is it really a subjective decision? Are you playing pink noise through it? And um, could you be led astray because sometimes what sounds best is more sub than you really need? Yeah, so this is an, a situation where it, 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 you're going to build up skill set as you go. Um, okay. And the first time you're buying a sub, and especially if you're new to being in the studio world, um, you might make a mistake here, and that's not a big deal. You don't have to, this isn't going to ruin your career if you get this wrong. Um, uh, the big thing is that. Um, you want it to sound neutral. And so I come back to this a lot. Get a pair of trusted headphones. Um, get the Sony MDR 7506, whatever that is. It's the, it's the go-to headphone. They're very flat. Um, anything you're listening through with that is going to sound flat. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, reference your mix on something like that. Um, you know, a mix that you know really well and get it to where the low end coming out of the sub sounds as close to the low end coming out of those headphones as you can. And you can more or less trust it. And trust your ears. Don't overthink things. You know, if it sounds bad, it's bad. If it sounds way overhyped, it's way overhyped. If you're thinking, yeah, I think this sounds pretty neutral. I think this sounds like the mix as I'm used to hearing it. It is. You're, if, if you are a human with normal hearing, you are qualified to make that decision. And you shouldn't right. get second guess it. That's a big thing. So it's really more about coming down to you be listening to real <coughs> reference material that you know and trust doing this exercise with. Because if you haven't listened to a ton of pink noise, you don't necessarily know what pink noise should sound like in your space. But if there's material right. that you've heard a bunch of times, you know what the kick drum sounds like in the best places you've heard it. You know what the bass sounds like in the best places you've heard it. Then you crawl around. My one guess here is that it might not be the Sony MDR 7506 is only because I wouldn't describe those as flat. They're a little hypey upper mids. Maybe a Sennheiser 650s are probably like those like go-tos. But then again, you could probably yeah. do it with any headphones that you know well if you know the 7506s really well and you've heard a bajillion mixes on them. Those could totally the be 7506 the is the low end on the 7506 is really flat. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I guess I was thinking more of like the upper mid like uh, thing in in them. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and don't take my word for it. Good, you know, Sonarworks has published the curves of like every headphone you could possibly consider buying. Yes. 
There's tons of headphone blogs that have done the same thing. You want a flat pair of cans and there's tons of them out there. Sure. Um, uh, just do a little bit of research and figure out which ones you can trust. Um, and the yeah. Sennheiser ones, like you mentioned, also have a uh, great reputation and the measurements I've seen on those look phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mighty Morphin in here writes to say, I have a subwoofer and it's all about the bass extension, not loudness. Though I use headphones to make sure my bass frequencies come through on headphones, uh, then I know that phones and laptops, et cetera, will be fine. So I think this is a, a cool idea here that sometimes people are feeling <laughs> like, I don't have enough volume in the low end. There's not enough hype. And it's not really, to my understanding, if you're using a sub properly, it's not about getting more level out of your bass. It's about having your bass go deeper. And I think that's one of the misconceptions a lot of people have about using a sub is that they're expecting like, if you're doing a sub ideally, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not like you should hear more 100 hertz or 80 hertz than you were before, assuming your speakers go down to 50 hertz already. It's just that instead of going down to, you know, their 60B down at 50 hertz, now they're flat at 50 hertz and they're flat at 45 yep. and they're flat at 40. So it's not so much hype as depth. Yeah, it's exactly that. You want to get as close to flat, as close to 20 hertz as you can. Um, and to get really nerdy and pedantic here, um, uh, so Dolby has published standards that I think are really valuable to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And so their standard for a full range speaker, so that is a speaker without a subwoofer, is that it should play down to, and don't quote me on this because I might be a hertz or a dB off, but it's like 41 hertz at negative four dB in the room. Um, mm. And any of our speakers will do that and almost any uh, uh, full range speaker that you buy from a real speaker company is gonna do that. Um, and then the subwoofer needs to give you down to minus three at 27 Hertz in the room. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> or sorry, down to minus, down to 31 and a half Hertz at minus three in the room. Um, and so again, in music, th this is actually different for film because you get into low frequency effects. But in music, yeah, it's not to add bass. It's to take the natural roll off of the speaker, which occurs in almost every speaker and certainly every speaker under $1,000 that you're going to be looking at buying um, and just fill in that low end down to the range of human hearing. Yeah. Now, another question here, this is a separate question. We're straying from subwoofers for a second, but for those people who are listening who are saying, I'm just not hearing enough bottom end in my room, like my low end just feels weak. And, you know, I have decent speakers. They should go down to 50 hertz or something, but I'm just not hearing enough bottom. And maybe this is a person whose problem isn't solved by a sub. Their room or listening position really is base light. What are you recommending for people in that situation? Maybe they have a pair of Cali IN8s, uh, your big IN8 speakers, remind me how low those go, probably into the 30 hertz range. Yeah, those play like into that. the 30s. Yeah. Yeah. So those speakers go plenty deep. They're listening to them. They feel like, I'm just not getting enough bass out of my speakers in my room. Should I get a sub? It sounds like their solution might not be 100% that they need a sub if it feels bass light in their listening spot. What kinds of solutions would be appropriate for that kind of person? Yeah. How much money you got? <laughs> um, <laughs> because... Um, one of the first things that I would look at is, is listening position and can we do something to fix listening position and monitor position to address that issue? Um, uh, the, the second thing I would look at is, do you have too much treatment in your room? I see this a ton mm. where people have invested a lot of money in treatment, um, and haven't invested a lot of money in measuring. And so on paper, everything should work. Um, but in reality, they're sucking out all the low end out of their room. Um, if you have $100 to invest, before you go buy any piece of gear, any subwoofer, even headphones, um, buy a measurement microphone um, and measure your room at the listening position and measure your room at some different listening positions and see what's going on. Um, because you might be able to see, oh, yeah, I have this huge dip um, from, you know, uh, 40 to 80 hertz in my room. And that is a room mode. Um, and that can be solved by putting the speakers and or your listening position in a different spot. Um, putting a subwoofer in the room in the same place where your speakers are isn't going to help fix that issue because it's the way that the position of the speakers and those frequencies are interacting with the room. Um, 
At the same time, if you have a lot of low-end problems and you're trying to fill in holes and you don't have the headroom to do it in your full range speakers, even outside the sort of sub bass region, you know, talking about from like 40 to 200 hertz or so, um, a subwoofer can be really helpful because subwoofers are made to take over those frequencies. And so you free up the woofer cone on your studio monitors to do stuff that is, you know, above that section and let the subwoofer do the work. Now, this is really interesting because this is uh, sort of something <laughs> I hadn't considered where subs might be beneficial. Let's say what you're saying is 100% correct, that one of the reasons that people will have a bass light or overabundance in bass in their listening position is how their speakers are positioned compared to them. And we find ourselves in, say, the trough in some type of room mode or room node, uh, a place where um, where I'm sitting, 80 hertz isn't represented well. And what we could do is if we move the speakers or move me, 80 hertz will sound better. But if all of a sudden everything below 200 hertz is taken over by the sub, now you just have one speaker that you can move and maybe it's impractical for you to move your speakers. You've picked the most ergonomic, best listening spot in your room, but your bass there doesn't work. Now, if you're offloading the low frequencies from your main speakers and you can find the ideal place for that sub to sit, you can get rid of some of those positioning problems you run into that might be impractical to solve by moving your seat or moving your main speakers, now you can just move the sub. Does some of that make sense? Yeah, I want you to just say that again 4,000 times because it's such <laughs> good advice. Um, there, is, there are really good places where you and your speakers should be in the room to get the best picture of your sound overall. And you're still mm -hmm. going to have some problems below 200 hertz, almost no matter what. Um, sure. If you're in a room, there's going to be something going on. Um, a sub can move and this is we get the question a lot like why don't you make a speaker that goes down to 20 hertz and the issue is you want to be able to move your sub just because it's a good position for your your full range monitors does not mean it's a good position for the subwoofer um as a point of reference a 100 hertz wave is almost exactly 10 feet and in order for your subwoofer to be um, time aligned with your main speakers without adding any sort of digital time alignment, you need to be in about two and a half feet. That's a quarter wavelength of 100 hertz. So you have two and a half feet either way to play with um, if you're using a uh, 100 hertz crossover or below. Um, that's a lot of space. Um, yeah, more than you know, I you can have one of the one of the um, best pieces of advice is to put your speakers about a quarter of the way into the room and put yourself um, about three eighths of the way into the room. Um, and that usually means you can put the subwoofer up against the wall and you can still have summation between the subwoofer and your mains for all the content that the subwoofer is handling. Um, and that can work really, really well in a lot of rooms. So yeah, exactly what you said. The subwoofer can move and you don't even have to worry about digital time alignment um, until you start to move the subwoofer, you know, more than two and a half, three feet away from the main speakers. Yeah. Great stuff. I, I wasn't aware of all that. And just to clarify this a little bit better here for me, if you don't mind, the two and a half feet, like you're assuming that we have a crossover at, let me back up. Are we assuming that the average crossover for a sub for music applications, not talking about Dolby surround sound, but for music applications, is 100 hertz a good crossover point? Uh, so we recommend 80. 100 hertz yeah. happens to be 10 feet, which is a real, yes. and happens to be close enough to three meters that it's like almost everybody can sort of picture what 10 feet looks like, right? Okay, um, so let me, before we go deeper into that recommendation <laughs> of crossovers and why, let's use this 100 hertz, 10 feet idea for just a second to talk more mm -hmm. about um, the sub placement. And then I wanna get more into your advice around which subs to look for, because there's different speaker sizes we could look for in subs, different wattages we could look for in subs, different sizes, all that stuff. And I wanna ask you questions there, as well as questions about crossover points. Before I do, just so I can get this better in my brain, if I was gonna put a sub in this room and the crossover point in theory was 100 hertz, that means I have about two and a half feet to play with before I run into meaningful issues with phase alignment between the subs and the speakers. Now, my question is that two and a half feet of play, is that two and a half feet away from a specific speaker? Does it have to be I perfectly in between the two speakers? Is it two and a half feet away from the 
middle point between the two speakers? So if you can give us a little bit more idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's two and a half feet between, you know, draw a line from your ear to your main speaker, draw a line mm -hmm. from your ear to the subwoofer. Those two lines with a hundred Hertz crossover should be within two and a half feet from each other. And what it is, is um, at the crossover point, you want to be within a quarter wavelength of the crossover point. Um, because at a quarter wavelength, you get summation. Once you move beyond a quarter wavelength, you start to get cancellation. Yeah. So, okay, I've got to add on to this. This might be a, a reason to potentially have two subs, because my guess is that if we were just to have one sub and two speakers, it shouldn't be more than two and a half feet away from either speaker, right? Not necessarily. Um, huh. Because if you're if you're in an equilateral triangle, you know, mm -hmm. picture the the side of your triangle, and let's say you're six feet away from your speakers, um, <coughs> which means if your subwoofer was vertically in line with your speakers, you're four and a half feet away from your subwoofer, but your subwoofer is not vertically in line with your speakers, so it's a little bit closer to the floor, which means you're probably closer to five feet from the subwoofer in a six foot equilateral triangle. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, now, let me go on to some questions about crossover points. Uh, Tommy and Mighty Morphin write in. Tommy says, talking about low-end roll-off on monitors, at which point should you set crossover points to match a sub with your monitor's frequency response? And Mighty Morphin adds on to this, Dolby recommends 85 hertz roll-off, so everything below 85 hertz uh, is sub and everything above is monitor. Um, the cones have way less work to do that way, and there's a cool separation and harshness. So Tommy's asking, what's the point? And M Mighty brings up this idea of 85 hertz being the Dolby recommendation that comes from, I believe, their um, you know surround sound standards. But yeah. maybe it's different from music. Uh, yeah, we use 80. Um, and honestly, the difference between 80 and 85 hertz when you're talking about a subwoofer crossover is splitting hairs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, gotcha. Uh, look at the low frequency response, which is generally published as either the minus six or the minus 10 specification of your full range monitors, double that. And that should be your crossover point roughly. Um, so for all of Cali's full range monitors, we recommend 80 because our low frequency spec is in the high thirties. Um, almost any monitor on the market today is going to be the same thing unless you're talking about um, some of the really tiny full range monitors with like a three inch cone. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a different different use case altogether. If you're if you have Yamaha's or Genelex or KRK's or Adams, whatever it is, 80 is pretty good. And those specific brands might have slightly different recommendations, but 80 is going to work. Um, and what that does is that takes care of like you said, it offloads a lot of the woofer energy. It also, um, in most ported full range systems, um, bypasses the port. The port is tuned for that lower frequency to sort of give you as much boost as possible um, once the woofer is at the maximum end of its performance. Um, so by using 80 hertz crossover on a system that naturally plays down to 40, you're not engaging the port anymore, which I believe in ports. I think they're a wonderful thing, um, but the base will be a little bit cleaner that way. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some of these design particulars, as in port, port size, speaker, speaker size, number of watts, and what's suitable. You've got two monitors here. For those of you who are watching the video version, I'm going to bring up <coughs> my screen share here. Oh, that's terrible. That's my wrong camera. Let me see how I can make this go back to my better camera. There we go. And let's go over to, there we go. Here's an image of your two major, major woofers in Project Watts. We've got the WS 6.2 and the WS 12. Can you give us the distinction between these two woofers, who they're made for, and why someone would want one size and space over another? Yeah, so the WS 12 was tailor-made to do uh, 5.1 with one subwoofer. Um, so that was the design goal of that sub with our INH, which is our loudest, most powerful speaker. Um, the and it's huge; it's a massive subwoofer. Um, it does fit in the back seat of a Toyota Corolla, um, but 
but even so, it's it's big. It's a big subwoofer to put under your desk. Um, so we knew we needed a smaller subwoofer, and we're looking at things that we could do in those lines. Um, and that's where the WS6.2 came from. The reason we used uh, two six and a half inch woofers rather than one 10 inch is that there are things that you can do with that that make the size of the enclosure substantially smaller. Um, and also when you have two woofers, you can horizontally oppose them. Um, so they're both side firing and they, they fire in opposite directions, which means there's no net vibration from the subwoofer, um, which when you're working in a home studio environment is really nice because the subwoofer isn't scooting around, it's not shaking, it's not shaking any of the things under your desk. Um, it's just sort of a nice uh, quality of life improvement. Um, the WS6.2 is made for stereo near and midfield monitors. Um, so the WS12 is really made for large format applications. We were thinking about Atmos when we designed the WS12, but it is really good for that application. Um, whereas the WS6.2 is made to be small first and foremost and give you the performance you need for a set of stereo speakers. Gotcha. So are there particular Cali audio monitors or <coughs> other brands monitors, speaker sizes in general that you would recommend one subwoofer for over the other? Is it more about their application or more about their main monitor sizes or room size? Yeah, no, it's definitely more about application. Um, when you're buying a subwoofer, whether you're buying a Cali subwoofer or anybody else's subwoofer, what you want to look for is that the subwoofer's max SPL matches the max SPL of all your other speakers added together. Mm -hmm. um so if you have two speakers that can each do 100 uh, db max spl you need a subwoofer that can do 103 db max spl um gotcha <coughs> and so again in a 5.1 environment you need with ina's you need a sub that can do 123 db max spl which ours handily does um right. and uh yeah, when you're when you're shopping for a sub to make sure that you're getting enough sub, that's sort of the way that you do it. The nice thing about subwoofers, again, because we're handling huge wavelengths, subwoofers sum really nicely together. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a subwoofer and it's the subwoofer you want and it just doesn't have the SPL to handle what you're doing, you just add another sub and put them right next to each other. And effectively, mm -hmm. those are acting as one subwoofer. Gotcha. So that would be a better approach than having two subs in stereo, each near two stereo monitors. Like if you needed more sub for two monitors, which you probably wouldn't, like that would be better than spacing them in kind of a stereo array, instead putting them together in your kind of ideal spot that you've discovered. Oh man, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if in your room, the ideal spot for your sub is in between the two mains, then yeah, you want to put them right next to each other. Um, in a lot of rooms, I, I hesitate to say most rooms, but in a lot of rooms, a trick that can work really, really well is to have one sub against one side wall and one sub against the other side wall. And what that will do is cancel the modes from side to side in your room. And then if you put the subs a quarter of the way in the room, it will cancel uh, most of the high energy modes. You will still have some modes, but they're higher in frequency and lower in energy. And that alone can fix a lot of the low end problems that you're going to have in your room, period. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. I typically recommend you know, either get one sub or start buying subs in pairs. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can play with the placement of the subs to negate issues that you have in your room. Gotcha. Now, just to clarify <laughs> this, to, to wrap this bit up, it sounds like selecting the right sub has little to do with the size of your actual speakers, the brand of your actual speakers, and it has most to do with matching SPL to your speakers. And can you give us that equation for anyone who missed it one more time of how you determine whether your subwoofer has enough SPL? Yeah, so your subwoofer max SPL should equal the max SPL of the total number of speakers you have. Um, so every time you double speakers, you're adding 3 dB. 
Um, mm. So if you have a sub, if you have speakers that can do 100 dB max SPL and you have two of them, you need a sub that can do 103. Yes, this idea of um, a doubling of power being 3 dB is important to recognize because my, uh, you didn't say that the first time. My guess is the average person here would be thinking, okay, I have two speakers that each put out 100 dB, so that's 200 <laughs> dB. So now I need... Not right, recognizing right, right, right. that's a logarithmic right. scale, right? Which is the natural thing. Most times uh, we're dealing with numbers. We're not dealing with logarithmic scales. So if someone has five speakers that all put out um, 100 dB, then we're adding on um, basically, I guess it would be four times three. So an additional 12 dB SPL if they were all no, putting out 100. When you add, when you double oh, you again, to- you're only... 3 dB again. So it'd be like roughly, if you're doing 5.1, you need roughly 7 dB more. If you're doing gotcha. at most with 7.1.4, you need roughly 10, right. roughly, and you might not even need that much. Um, yes. But you're not um, doubling 103 <laughs> again. You're adding another 100 to the 103 that you've created, which is not another doubling up to 106. Right. So, right. Are there any handy calculators that people could use to kind of figure this out uh, or, or any good resources for that kind of thing? Um, probably. I don't know anything off the top <laughs> okay. of um, We're not I'm the sure. resource for it right now. But no. yes, well, um, Dolby has a tool called the Dart, which is the Dolby Atmos room design tool, um, mm-hmm. where you can put in all the speakers you're considering using, including the subwoofers, and it will tell you mm-hmm. if you're going to meet spec or not based on your room size. Um, that takes uh, you got to be well prepared to use that, and if you're just buying a stereo pair of speakers, it's way too much work for what you're looking at. The big takeaway is don't get speakers that can do 115 dB max SPL and a sub that only does 90. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. That makes a lot of sense to me. All right. uh, Let's go through some more of these questions uh, here. Ant-Man Felix asks, is adding a subwoofer more for hearing the low end or feeling it? What are your thoughts there, Nate? Oh, man. Um, So... I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a lot of Technically, thoughts. anything um, above 20 hertz, the average person can hear with their ears, but that doesn't mean we're not also feeling it with our bodies. I would say that a lot yeah. of those frequencies below 200, we're feeling with our bodies in addition to hearing with our ears, which may not be true for, say, you know, 5K or something like that. Um, the primary goal of a recording studio and the primary goal of studio monitors in the recording studio is to tell the person who is mixing or mastering or producing the music that what they're listening to is going to translate to other playback systems. And 99% of the time, that is, I am making a commercial track that is going to be played back on earbuds and car stereos and in um, you know, the grocery store, whatever it is, I need to know that this is going to sound good. Um, that is not always the case though. And it's not always about, Hey, does this, this, uh, does this track translate? Sometimes it's about how does this feel? How does this feel when I turn my speakers up really, really loud? Um, does the bass hit me in the chest? And so one of the examples I'll give is, uh, when we were at, when I was at JBL, um, we were making subwoofers and a lot of people ended up buying PA subwoofers to go into high-end studios. I mean, these are studios where major artists with major label uh, uh, production behind them were going to make their music. And it wasn't about, oh, is this totally flat down to 20? It's if I crank this up and I have a ton of subwoofer, do I feel it in my chest? Um, And it's, and if you're making hip hop for the club, that is way more important than does this translate to the grocery store. Um, (laughs) So um, it really comes down to what are you making and for who and why. And yeah, it is important that you get flat translation all the way down to 20 hertz. But in a lot of applications, absolutely, it's important that you can crank that up and the subwoofer is going to hit and it's going to hit hard and it's going to hit heavy. Um, And you just need to know if you need that or not. And yeah, if you need that, you need to go out and buy a big ass, powerful subwoofer. You can't sort of use the equation we talked about earlier and be like, oh, it's exactly flat to 20. You need more than that. Um, But that's something that you need to know about your own workflow. And there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer for that. Yeah. 
Great. Uh, I think that's a, a great answer. And that is definitely something I've heard before, particularly from electronic artists and, and hip hop artists as well about wanting systems with subs to approximate a like live like festival environment or club environment and um, see how it would like physically feel in that situation. Because the physical feeling people get in dance floors, clubs, festivals is part of the experience and they want to know how it's going to translate to a sound system um, because for a lot of these artists you have to remember that their recorded music is what they're bringing with them to their live show it's not about creating it right there on the stage it's about creating an experience for people in your studio that <coughs> can translate to those big environments so there must be a learning curve to that as well when you get your sub listen to how tracks bang in the club that you go to regularly and listen to how they bang at home on your sub so for someone who's in that world uh, depending on how loud they're listening um, I would imagine the single WS-12, the larger 12-inch woofer that you guys make would be the right way to go, unless their monitoring situation is so loud that they would need more than one of those subs to increase the max SPL there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. A uh, couple more questions here. What's better for home studio? Two three-way monitors or a pair of two-way monitors paired with a sub? This is a great question. This is like my favorite question because for me, I've never been a huge sub guy because most of the studios I worked in didn't have subs and I got acclimated to the sound of subless speakers. I've been in great sounding rooms with subs as well. But um, right now I have a set of very similar to your IN8s. I have your IN8s as well, which are awesome. But the ones in front of me right now are very similar design. They are eight inch with a coaxial uh, driver. This is like you guys with the IN8 basically made my favorite kind of speaker design, which is three-way eight inch drive uh, woofer a four or five inch, you know, for the mid range and then a yeah. tweeter inside of it. Just brilliant type of design. You guys make it for like less than a thousand. Is it like around a thousand bucks a pair? I mean, uh, it's 800 a pair, 800. It's less than less yeah. than a thousand bucks a pair. If you guys haven't heard the INH, it's unreal how well they perform for an $800 pair of speakers. Like there's, it's hard to find anything in that price range that comes close to the kind of, I think, detail, mid range detail and kind of, just this revealing character that they have. And I'm not just saying this because, you know, Nate helped sponsor MixCon and made the whole thing happen and sponsored Jeff Ellis's presentation. Regardless of all this, um, I was really floored by how good and how effective they were at $800 for a set of monitors. Um, Jeff Ellis, in case you didn't check it out, there was recently a MixCon masterclass. Jeff Ellis has monitors that cost way more than the Cali's, but he uses the Cali IN8s as his main stereo monitors and for his whole surround sound system, basically replacing monitors that cost many times more. But for someone who's shopping in this budget, okay, I have $800 to spend. Should I get just a pair of IN8s <coughs> or should I get a smaller set of monitors and then add a sub to it? What's the right answer there, assuming that the costs are pretty much the same for smaller set of monitors with a sub or a bigger set of mains that are a three-way? Um. I think you really need to know what your workflow is going to be. Um, you really need to know how comfortable you are uh, checking things on headphones. You really need to know how comfortable you are integrating the subwoofer into the room. Um, if it were my money, I would go buy the the pair of studio monitors that I wanted um, and that I felt good about. Uh, and you can always buy a sub later. Um, you know, you're not you're not shooting yourself in the foot, not getting everything all at once. Um, yes. You are yes. limiting yourself, and you know you might need to replace it if you go buy a cheaper pair of full range monitors, so you can afford a sub right away. Um, and you might not need the sub, honestly. Um, so yeah, I I think it really don't buy a sub until you say you need a sub, until you say it's going to make my life better, it's going to make my mixing better if I have a subwoofer. Um, mix for a while without one. And by all means, please go buy my subwoofer. I really want you to yeah. go buy it right yeah. now without thinking about it. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, um, you don't need a sub right away. Um, go buy the monitors you want and add a sub later. Gotcha. So first, fo I think I would second <laughs> this advice. First, focusing in on what are the best monitors for me. Let me hope that that answer solves the problem like the inh which should go down into give you really usable information down below 40 hertz and into the 30 hertz range like maybe that's enough for you 
peering into the 30s. It's going to be enough for most people and it's going to be enough for most rooms. And I know what you're saying about there not being technical limitations based on room size, that you could have a small room that's able to reproduce low frequencies. But that said, the average really small room is generally treated poorly enough that chances are that it doesn't reproduce extremely well below 40 hertz. And adding a lot of stuff below 40 hertz, maybe just being able to hear 40 hertz and above really well would be awesome. And maybe something like I and H could do that. And then if you decide for yourself, A, I want to go a little bit low, uh, lower, or B, I want to make my low end even better. And the sub is going to allow me to place my low end generating device in the perfect spot without having to move my monitors. Then you can do that later on. And when you want to improve things, you don't have to go from cheap small speakers to bigger speakers. You're taking the big speakers you already know, love, and trust and just making the low end better by adding the sub. So maybe that's the ideal order to do things in. Does some of that make sense? Yeah. I mean, look, I'm kind of a cheapskate and <laughs> I like to spend my money right. Um, yeah. that sound, that's what I would do. I'm not, I'm not going to tell anybody they're wrong to go buy it all at once. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry. I would not fret over the decision of should I get option A which is uh, cheap speakers in a sub right now, um, or option B, which is less cheap speakers. Get the less cheap speakers. Get the, again, get the speakers you want. Get the speakers that are going to serve you for a long time. Now, there's one use case or two use cases really where I could think about being different, where I might say to somebody, just get the speakers with the sub right out of the gate, even though I'm 100% for my own personal use is aligned here. There's two situations where I could see being different. One is that you're in such a small space where it does not make sense for you to have speakers that are much larger than like a four inch driver or something like that. And you need speakers that are relatively close to you and like just ergonomically desk situation, like how much space you have for stands behind your desks. It's just stupid for you to have eight inch speakers in your room. And what makes sense for your space are these four or five inch speakers, but you also want lows, then maybe you're the kind of person who's like, you know what, I'm going to get four inch speakers, five inch speakers, and turn them into three ways by adding a sub. I can imagine that person benefit from benefiting from subs right out of the gate and subs with less expensive speakers. And I can also imagine the situation where we are doing music for the club, we're doing EDM, we're doing hip hop, and just right out of the gate, we want, we know that hearing and feeling those subs is one of the most important things for us in translation to the listening environments we're in. And the subs have to be part of our monitoring budget. We're going to make decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I'm glad you mentioned that. We happen to make a desktop monitor called the INUNF that is made yes. to go on your desk. We're running a sale right now where you can get that and the WS 6.2 for a thousand dollars. I'm going to pull that up. That uh, you've it <laughs> skipped my mind, but yes, I'm going to pull this up so people can see it. And let's talk about this set of monitors real quick, because this is an ingenious set of monitor designs that has something <laughs> like a sub built in, but you can add on yet another kind of deeper sub. Uh, for people who haven't seen this, hold on, give me one second so I can pull up the actual image of this. Here's my web sharing screen and here it is, the UNF. Let me click learn more on it. Hopefully I'll get taken over to it. Um, products, studio monitors. I didn't click it soon enough. Here's our lineup, project independence, and here it is, the INUNF. And I'll describe it for people who are listening to the audio only version of this. Those of you who are on the video version can see it on your screen. It looks like two little circles. These are, was it a four or five inch driver with a tweeter inside? Yeah, it's of a it? four inch driver. So it's yeah. like a little coaxial design, almost like if you took the mid range driver and the tweeter out of the INA and, and then it kept exactly it as a little that. circle and put it on your desk. And then in addition to that, there's this big rectangular box, which is almost kind of like a desk mounted subwoofer. But not quite. Yeah, it's not a subwoofer. This is me being the most pedantic ass in the world. It is not a yes. subwoofer. It right. plays because it takes over at what, like five hundred hertz or something. Uh, at three hundred hertz, a subwoofer gotcha. is designed to play from the bottom of the frequency spectrum up to somewhere between one and two hundred hertz, and this does not do that. Um, so we call it a base unit. But everyone who is not me on the planet calls it a sub, and they're incorrect. Um, but I can probably stop fighting them on that. Yes. But you can now add on to this. You're saying there's a sale price right now where you would get this UNF system and the UNF comes with the two speakers plus the base unit. Like you can't just buy the, the two little speakers by themselves. Yep. They're designed to go together, the two speakers plus the base unit. And right now there's a sale price where you can add on a sub to go even deeper than the UNF normally does. Is that right? 
Yep, that's exactly right. And the INUNF, what's cool about it is that it it incorporates your desk as an acoustic member of the system. So almost any other speakers that you put on a desk, you, you know, you're going to have desk reflections. I don't know of another manufacturer who has taken the time to account for those desk reflections and take them out digitally, which is what we've done with the INUNF. The INUNF really is made to go on your desk. And for people who are space limited and limited with how loud they can get, um, I, I can't think of a better speaker. And that's not just me wanting to sell a ton of these. Yeah. Well, I mean, you definitely made them to suit a need. There are people in that situation where only small desk mounted speakers work. These would go literally right down your desk and kind of point up at you. And the fact that they swivel upwards is taking the minimal reflections that come from these mid range and high frequency drivers kind of out of the equation by tilting up. And then the thing, the, the thing that's putting out the 300 hertz and below where they're a little bit more omnidirectional and you'd have even more reflection issues, um, you're able to compensate for that um, yeah. coming through your desk. And using your desk as an acoustic membrane is an interesting idea. Now, the, the only concern I would have, this would be my only thought about what might be a, um, a drawback of this design, is because your desk is being used as an acoustic membrane, does that kind of mess with the transient response, the, the dynamics uh, response? Sorry, so it's, it's, it's not a membrane. It's a member. So basically what we're taking to, into account is the boundary reflection of the sub of the desk. Um, so we're not using it to vibrate. And actually the WS 6.2 does this, or the INUNF does the same thing that the WS 6.2 does where it's got two horizontally opposed woofers. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't transfer any acoustic energy uh, mechanically um, from that woofer system into the desk or into anything else on your desk. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does account for the bounce from the desk to your ear. Um, oh, gotcha. And we've also got right. settings that will account for if you need to put it up against a wall that account for that bounce as well. Very cool. All right. <laughs> um, I want to answer more questions about subwoofers before I do for people who are not acquainted with Cali Audio. We've gone through almost your whole product lineup, but I want to bring them all up on screen here because there's one more product we haven't talk, uh, talked about that I got to hear that I thought was pretty amazing. But just so people know, there's four different categories here. I'm going to bring them up on screen. There's Project Lone Pine. Your original speakers you put out were the LP6s, which really kind of took over. I think at that time, they were um, some of the most affordable speakers out there, but some of the uh, easily some of the most high performance speakers in their price range. These are your two-way series, Project Lone Pine. Yep. They're six inch and eight inch. And then you have Project Independence, which is a five inch uh, and an eight inch. And they are both your coaxial three-way designs. Quick yep. question here. Who would you recommend Project Lone Pine to, your two-way monitors, versus Project Independence, your, your IN series monitors? Why would someone get a smaller IN5 rather than a larger LP8? Uh, money. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we've tried to do as good a job as possible as you move up in how much money you're spending on our speakers. Uh, it's a better speaker. Um, and so, uh, the LP series is designed for a price point, um, designed to be as inexpensive as possible and still give you a speaker that you can make professional records on. That is the whole goal of that system. Um, if you can afford the IN series, it is a better speaker objectively in every way. Um, but I know that there's a lot of people um, who are saving up uh, for a long time to get a set of seri serious studio monitors and $400 might be what they're able to save up. And they should get a pair of LP6s and that's going to be a fantastic uh, system for them. Yeah. It is shockingly good for the, the price point that they come in at. So really uh, commend you there. The INUS, <laughs> this is for a person who can't justify putting normal full-size speakers in their space, desk-mounted system. And the last one, uh, we talked about the subwoofers. There being two different ones, the WS 6.2, which um, are ideal for stereo setups and smaller spaces. And then the WS 12, which is a single driver that's for uh, larger setups, higher SPL demands, and for multi-channel setups. Um, but the last one we haven't talked about, uh, these, the Project Santa Monica, the SM5Cs, this seems to be totally different than anything else you guys have. There's a five inch woofer, which is relatively small, but it goes surprisingly deep. And then a four inch driver coax design with a, um, a tweeter inside of it. 
and these are your most expensive offerings. Uh, what are you trying to achieve with the Project Santa Monica, the SM5s, and who are those meant for? Yeah, so Project Santa Monica um, is kind of our cyber truck at this point in that we've announced it, but no one has one. Um, <laughs> uh, but a lot of people have gotten a demo. Um, we yep. are hoping to have these um, properly on the market sometime in February. Um, but we get asked a lot, the IN8 is in a lot of professional studios. You know, Jeff Ellis uses it. The Village uh, has an Atmos system made of IN8s. Um, there are Grammy-winning hit records that you've heard that were mixed on IN8s, um, or video games that you've played, or movies that you've seen in the last few years that were made on IN8s. Um, there is, uh, from a translation standpoint, is what I'm listening to going to translate. There is no reason to get a more expensive speaker than an IN8. Um, <laughs> we got asked a lot, if this is the speaker you can make for $400, what can you do for Genelec money or Neumann money or ATC money? Um, and so the Santa Monica series is our answer to that. Whereas the Project Independence, much like Project Lone Pine, is designed to hit a lower price point and makes engineering compromises and materials compromises and manufacturing compromises based on that. Uh, Project Santa Monica makes none of those compromises. We are using the best materials available, the best electronics available, the best manufacturing processes available. Um, and so uh, it is a substantially better speaker than the IN series. Um, it will give you lower distortion and higher output and greater linearity um, even than uh, the IN8s and the IN5s will. And who would be the kind of user who wants that? Since you're saying for actually making <laughs> records and delivering on the promise of these translate, the INHs are good enough for literally anybody who would want uh, to spend more for uh, a speaker that has possibly better specs. So who, who's the ideal client for a Santa Monica speaker? Yeah, uh, anybody who wants those better specs. And I think it's just a it's just a quality of life thing when you're mixing, being able to hear a greater level of detail, working with lower distortion at higher SPLs. Um, you know, you know, I've, I see uh, a very expensive speaker on your desk behind you there. Um, mm -hmm. The difference when you go up in terms of the quality of components that are used, um, it's nicer to listen to. It's nicer to work on. Um, the translation might be exactly the same, but um, your workaday life is probably a little bit nicer on those nicer speakers, which is why I'm guessing you spent more money on them. Um, right, right. And so yeah. um, that's yeah, what we're trying the, to address. The, the I and H, to be honest, the I and H, um, if I was mixing, I would probably be using the I and H. I have some monitors, I'm not going to say the brand, that are basically the same design as the I and H, except I think the I and H have a port and mine are a closed box. Um, but my speakers that I'm using, because I, I do mastering, um, I did want to go for something that had a slightly lower noise floor and slightly better transient response. But these speakers, instead of costing $800, these speakers are $4,000 for the pair. And that is yep. a huge difference to be literally, I would say, maybe 10% better than the INAs. Like, yeah, it, and I mean, it, it, that's... they're in the same ballpark, to be honest. And we're talking about <laughs> literally thousands of dollars. More. Yeah. And, you know, we know that um, yeah. once you get to something like the INA, um, you're, you need to spend twice as much money to get 5% better. Yes. Um, uh, and it that it continues to be an issue of diminishing returns as you go up. You can always build a more expensive speaker, but what are you really getting for it? Um, but with the SM series, um, the passive ones are $1,000 each. The powered ones are going to be $1,700 each. Um, we really wanted to address that. You know, there is a market. We believe in what we've done engineering-wise, um, and we want to make something that doesn't have any of these compromises um, that gives people, you know, as far as we're concerned, for the size and the output, this is the best possible speaker we can build. Yeah. Well, very impressively done. Uh, last quick question here on the Santa Monica is um, why a 5-inch driver instead of an 8-inch driver is going to be the flagship most expensive make no compromises one. Um, why the slightly smaller than one might expect driver size? Yeah, we're going to do both. Um, gotcha. uh, our market research shows that at this price point, um, that is the most commonly purchased size. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Great answer. All right. Let's see if there's any last minute questions or comments that have come <coughs> from our audience, and then I'll uh, let you go here. But um, give me uh, one sec here to catch up on the questions. Um, 
Interesting. Ants, or it's actually Joe uh, writing in under Ants' account. Just curious, but is there a technique where you edit using headphones in addition to a sub with maybe appropriate latency for the headphones? What Joe's describing sounds a bit to me like what I've heard of uh, a sub pack, like haptics or something like that. Uh, can you speak to the idea of using headphones with a sub? Is that a viable thing? Uh, it That sounds like a really good way to introduce a lot of unknowns. Um, I would, I, I just wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, the the closest thing that gets rid of that kind of latency issue and gives you some of the feeling is uh, something called the sub pack. Uh, it's made for being with headphones. It literally ties around your waist and it's like a haptic design where, which means that you don't hear it, but you feel the low frequency vibrations. And some people who have used, I've never even demoed it, but some people who have demoed it have told me like, oh, surprising that like, it didn't feel terrible. Like it didn't like it, it enhanced the experience rather than just being like, why did someone invent this garbage? I've heard people say like, oh, I was surprised that it wasn't garbage, but I really can't speak to it. So um, no idea there. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, Benj has joined us. Good to see you, Benj. Good to see you, uh, Ant-Man Felix. Uh, great to have you guys in here. Eddie Ortega says, hi, everyone. I just bought two Cali subs to pair with my LP6s at home. Any advice? Um, I think, Eddie, uh, we've given some decent advice on how to place these in case you missed it a little earlier. Um, what Nate was saying is one of the best things you can do is put your sub in the chair and then crawl around and find the perfect spot where your your sub sounds great. Any additional advice you'd give to someone who uh, just got their uh, the subs to go with their LP6s? Um, yeah, take the day. Um, don't try to mix mm. anything. Um, don't try to uh, get any work done. Take the day experiment with placement of the subwoofers, experiment with do you want to run one line left and one line right, or do you want to run everything into both subs, Um, experiment with the subs being in the middle of the room together, experiment with them being on the side walls about a quarter of the way into the room, Um, just play around um, for as long as you have um, and get to a point where you feel really happy about it. Love it. Do it on a day where you don't have to do anything else um next one here is uh the arsonist who says thank you i have the cali lp8s and i love them good stuff uh chimney sway says that when you use a sub you should be able to feel it in your hankles all right uh good good to know uh creatism says i have uh cali's and subs um version one daz says i'm currently waiting for my ion eights to arrive to replace my lp6s which replaced my personas eris 4.5s a journey mostly dictated by having to keep my kids fed at the same time that sounds like a (laughs) pretty ideal uh set of upgrades there and i really do think that with each of those upgrades that probably made a significant difference going from the the 4.5s by Prezonis to the LP6s was probably a big step up. And I really think you are going to hear a big step up from the LP6s to the INAs for me, particularly just in how the mid-range presents in those sets of speakers. But there's also the additional depth that the, the 8s offer. So congrats to you. The Arsonist says, I have had my lp 8 V1 for over three years and they are amazing. I'm an audio engineering student. William Hutton Pillar says, I would think get the subs right off the bat so you can get used to the sound of your system. So I think that's how him weighing in on the idea of what kind of system uh, to get. Uh, Benj says, I have a sub pack. It's actually dope. <coughs> so yes, I think Benj is one of those people and he's a very credible source. One of these people who makes me believe that um, I want to demo the sub pack and see what it's all about because um, you're not alone in saying this, uh, Benj, that it's like, it's actually kind of cool. Uh, Joel Cruz says, been using Cali audio monitors for the last couple of years of my professional work. Been on IN8 for the last year. Thanks for the amazing gear at such an amazing price. And uh, last question here is from uh, Joe writing in on Ants' account. It says, where are Cali's manufactured? Uh, we make everything in China, um, which is to hit the price point. Um, we have a team over there that oversees all the production. Um, and at the end of production, we do full testing to make sure that everything is hitting the specs before it comes over to the States or Europe or wherever else it's going. Yeah. I'm curious if, have you ever priced out if you had to make LP sixes in the United States, what they would end up costing? Yeah. They would cost 10 times as much. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I hear you. Yep. That is the, the world that we live in. Uh, Icy Sasuke asks, 
how to time align the subs with the mains without software or hardware to do it. So you kind of gave us a, he gave us a rule of thumb earlier on. Where <coughs> you said, Nate, that if the crossover was at 100 hertz, which is not what you recommend, you recommend 80 hertz, then as long as they're within two and a half feet of one of the two main speakers, they should be sufficiently time aligned, is my understanding. Uh, can you get anything more specific for us about time aligning the subs? Because that's something that people get nervous about, putting them in the wrong spot. So uh, any other yeah, ideas absolutely. about how to best time align them? Um, so uh, picture a line going from your ear to each each member of your system. So from the left speaker to the right speaker to the subwoofer, you uh, want that line to be as close in length as possible. And if you want to be dead on time aligned, it needs to be the exact same length. Um, so you should be able to take a uh, uh, measuring tape and get it out and from your ear, just poke each member of your system. Um, I just looked it up and you can look this up really easily whatever your crossover point is, just search that frequency and wavelength and it will tell you how long it is. Um, with an 80 hertz wave, it is 14 feet. Um, mm -hmm. So 14 over four. Right, three and a half? <coughs> it's three and a half feet. Um, uh, so that is the space that you have to play, again, if you have a measuring tape, um, where you can have up to that much difference. Um, Seriously, a measuring um, a measurement microphone costs a hundred dollars. Uh, you can use any microphone on the planet for time alignment. Um, there's a piece of software called Room EQ Wizard. Um, this is the software that we use when we go and tune an Atmos room. We're using this free software. We're not using Smart or Sonarworks or anything like that. Um, uh, time alignment is super easy in software. Um, all you need is a microphone and a loop back into your interface to tell you what the, the zero time is. Um, and then you just uh, do a little bit of math to figure out what the difference between one and the other is. Um, and there are a lot of ways to add delay to one member of your system. Um, there's tons of hardware pieces that will do it. There's software that you can do it. Um, there's free programs that can do it in sort of janky ways. There's expensive stuff that can do it really cleanly. Um, it is, it's really worth the time to um, invest the time to get it done right. Uh, but if, if, you, if you don't have the time, and if you don't care to invest that time to do it, um, like I said, just take a measuring tape and make sure that you are the same distance from your ears to every member of your system, your left monitor, your right monitor, and your subwoofer. So it sounds to me like you're saying that <coughs> I measure how far I am from my speakers. Say I am um, six feet from my speakers. My subwoofer should also be six feet away from me. And that can be in any direction or is there a certain plane? Can it be six feet behind me? Or does it, uh, can it be six uh, feet off axis 90 degrees? Or is there other ideas there? It depends on your crossover point. Um, Ideally, you want it more or less in front of you. Um, uh, if your crossover point is super low or if you have multiple subs, yeah, you can kind of put them anywhere because you're getting omnidirectional sound. Um, it, it depends on your room. And the best, the best place to start is just put the sub halfway between your speakers. Um, start there. Maybe it doesn't work. Right. Then you have to move it up or back, or you want to put it up against a, uh, one of the side walls. Um, but that's a great place to start, and there's no reason not to try and start there. So if my speakers are six feet away from me, a good place to start is six feet away from me in between my two speakers, and then I can move it forward and back by up to three and a half feet from that position and still be essentially additive, although it won't necessarily be 100% perfectly time aligned in that spot. Um, That's right. And, and I should still be, <coughs> if, let's say, crossover of 80 hertz, I have this three and a half feet of wiggle room, my speakers are six feet away from me, and I put it, the subwoofer directly between those two speakers, and I find the best place where the low end presents the best is two feet closer. So now my speakers are six feet away from me, and my sub is four feet away from me. Do I have to time align my sub for it to work properly? Or can I say, 
hey, right there is fine. That's good enough. Yeah, um, right there is probably fine. Um, if you want to be sure, and yeah, timeline yourself, um, two milliseconds. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, don't, it, a millisecond is a foot at normal air temperature in normal uh, pressure. Uh, you know, let's not get into the botanics of it. A millisecond is roughly a foot in terms of speed of sound. Um, but d use measurement tools um, if you're gonna time a line. Don't just sort of eyeball it and hope. Mm -hmm. So time alignment and lining is not ne <coughs> not 100% necessary, but could be a nice to have. And if you were to do so, can you reiterate the short version one more time of how to time align? You would take a microphone and it doesn't have to be a measurement microphone and then tell it does not have to be one a, more time. Yeah. So um, if you go get Romy Q Wizard, I think they even have a little like the, the, the program will walk you through every step of what to do. Um, and you just need to make sure you're reading carefully. But basically you plug your microphone into your interface. Uh, you plug one of your outputs from your interface back into the interface. So it's a loop back, which tells you how much uh, system delay you have from the computer to the interface. Um, and then you play a sign sweep, and it will tell you uh, what the delay is between uh, the source hitting play and that arriving at the microphone position, which you're going to put where your ears go. Um, you switch over to uh, your subwoofer or your next speaker or whatever, play a sign sweep again. It'll tell you how long it takes for it to arrive. You do just some quick math to subtract the higher arrival time from the lower arrival time, and then you'll add that much delay to uh, the thing that is arriving faster. Gotcha. And then how would you add <coughs> that delay to your system? Uh, you can do it as a DAW plugin um, on the output channel going to the, whatever's arriving sooner. Um, you can do it like if you're using an Avid Matrix, um, there are really easy tools to add delay there. Most higher end um, monitor controller slash um, IO boxes have the ability to add delay. Um, you can do it with a virtual output card. You can use this uh, uh, output card from a system or from a company called Rogue Amiga, Rogue Amoeba, um, and you can add uh, delay as a plugin onto one of your outputs that way. There's a lot of ways to do it, and there's yeah, the only than issue there is if, we, if we're talking about a two-way speaker system that a sub that has a <laughs> sub, the way the two-way speaker system is going to work um, would be. Uh, for the way your subs are set up is basically the outputs from my interface are going into the sub and then from the sub it's going out to the speakers oh yeah you can't time align if you're if you're uh, using the subs I mean some subs have this built in but they're way more expensive um, you can't time align if you're using the subs built in crossover gotcha so uh, in a lot of cases um, where someone was going to try to time align things we're talking about people who are buying usually an additional piece of hardware or much more expensive subs that have additional hardware basically built into them um, yeah. that are doing this stuff. So even with something like uh, Sonarworks, adding Sonarworks to a system is not going to time align your sub for you. But that's right. here's the big kicker is that time aligning is not 100% necessary. The effects at these distances, as long as you're within this, say, uh, I believe it was three and a half feet room for error, time aligning is kind of an optional rather than a necessity. Um, there are people who will argue that if everything is not perfectly time aligned at the crossover point, that you can hear uh, uh, sort of a bass flubbiness because of that, um, mm -hmm. because part of the bass wavelength is not arriving at the same time as everything else. And so uh, there's carryover from the transients. Not everything is going to be as clean. Um, I'm not going to weigh into that argument. I will say personally, I don't hear it but that's not to say that it's not there. Um, so certainly there is an argument for it and it would be incorrect to be like, oh, it's time aligned. It, it's not time aligned if it's just within yes. that three and a half feet. But, but again, we're still... talking about the difference of in increasing your system performance by five or 10%. <coughs> and now we're no longer talking about buying, remind me of the cost of your smaller subwoofer. How much is that one? It's $500. $500 for the smaller subwoofer. And then what's the price yeah. of the LP6s? Uh, $400 for the pair. $400 for the pair. So now all of a sudden we'd be going from a really affordable system that might be as little as a $900 system 
to now to do all this time alignment stuff, we're talking about adding on significant initial additional hardware um, or significantly more expensive subs for what is, if there's a difference, we're probably talking about in the realm of a 10% or less difference rather than a 50% or more difference. I would imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. We're talking about a 3% or less difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So that's good stuff to weigh in. So you don't have to get too nervous about this stuff. If what you can afford is LP6s and a sub, and you feel like you are, are tremendously going to benefit from a sub, the fact that you're not perfectly timing lining them down to the millisecond does not destroy all the benefits that you're going to get by from adding a sub. You still get the same benefits from adding the sub. You don't have to be afraid of this because people talk about all this extra math and physics stuff doesn't mean it's super duper relevant to the average user of studio monitors. Does that sound roughly accurate? Uh, you can make a record and win a Grammy with it with uh, a pair of, with a system that costs less than a thousand dollars. Yeah. Yes. You don't need to worry yes. about getting into high level acoustic science. Yes. Gotcha. hundred percent agreed there. Um, there's still going to be a market for <coughs> multi-thousand dollar speaker systems, but they are not required for mixing great records. I hope you guys go and mix some great records. Thanks for spending almost an hour, uh, slightly more than an hour talking to us about everything subs and speaker design in general. Uh, it was great to have you here, Nate. I really love the guy, work you guys are doing over at Cali. Um, I see that Chimney and Icy uh, also wrote in some stuff here. Um, uh, I don't know if we have time for this one last question. Um, I have time. All right, we'll do it. We're already over an hour, Mark, so it's not going to hurt us to go even further. I'm going to read through these last three questions, ending with Jimmy. And Jimmy, you officially have the last question in here, and that's it. We're going to go lightning round here. First of all, Chimney says, enjoying my IN5 so much, hoping to grab the Cali sub one day as my uh, for my terrible sounding room. Would love to hear more about sub placement versus acoustic bass trap type solutions. Um, so those are two ways of solving low-end problems in your room is one place in the sub and two acoustic bass traps. Uh, which of those um, solutions, acoustic bass traps or subs, do you think is more cost effective and which one do you think is less complex? Um, <laughs> uh, don't so, go by... So if you're going to buy bass traps, um, you need to buy a measurement microphone first and you need to know exactly what problems you're trying to address with those bass traps. A lot of people say, oh, my room sounds boomy. It's a small room. I need broadband bass traps. And all you're doing there is you might have a problem that looks like this and you're just t making the problem quieter, um, yes. which isn't solving the problem. It's just making it harder to tell what the hell's going on. Um, it's mm -hmm. like if your bassist is out of tune and you just turn them down instead of having them tune their instrument. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so before you go and buy bass straps, buy a measurement microphone, figure out how to measure your room, figure out what problems you're trying to solve. Um, the, the right thing to do is to buy tuned bass traps um, that will remove the specific problems you have. The wrong thing to do in some rooms, this might happen. You just have a lot of broadband bass energy that you need to take down overall. That's almost no room that I've ever seen. Um, and so don't just go buy a bunch of bass absorbers and hope that the problem's going to go away. You're just not going to be able to hear it as well. Hmm. That's interesting. You know, I've, I've definitely been in rooms <laughs> where I've heard them benefit from broadband bass absorption because it is what I think of it as doing, and this is not a hundred percent accurate, but what I think of it as doing is, is taking the modes and nodes in, in, in the frequency area at which they're effective and decreasing the amplitude of those modes and nodes so that they are slightly less out of whack, but you are absolutely not, you're doing that kind of across the entire spectrum. Um, and you are definitely not targeting in on your specific problem. But it's like, I would say, I hope that maybe I'm, I could be wrong here. You definitely know more about this stuff than I do, but let me give you my understanding and tell me if it's incorrect that let's say you have a, um, you know, a, a big hump at a hundred Hertz and a big lull at 50 Hertz, then getting broadband absorption, absorption to the room that was effective down to 50 Hertz and below, like imagine that that's the case. And I, I don't know that it is for what most people are using, but it would flatten both of those humps. Like you wouldn't have as much of a node either 
like you would reduce the node amp like the the negative amplitude of the node as well as reducing the amplitude of the mode i think like wouldn't you be smoothing out the low end response in a broadband way but not one that's nearly as effective or targeted as a frequency dependent bass track is that my experience somewhat correct uh, maybe my experience listening in rooms that are using a lot of broadband bass absorption is that they just sound dead. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like a room where uh, music goes to die. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I just don't think it's valid. Um, I, I would be very surprised if records made in those rooms translate easily for first time users who aren't used to wrapping their head around what's going on acoustically. And mm -hmm. I have not yeah. enjoyed listening to music in those rooms. Fair enough. I will say that one of the benefits to the targeted absorption is that it takes away the need. Like if you were to really try to solve your problems just using broadband absorbers, you would, you could a hundred percent over absorb in your room quite easily. Yep. And what the targeted stuff does is allows you to do less broadband absorption. But I do think that like there's two different solutions here. Like, well, for me, I feel like if you were to try to put six inch thick panels that are separated out from the wall all around your room and like every bit of your room is covered with broadband absorption just to try to target your low frequencies, you're going to overly deaden your room. That said, if you have a more sane... Um, reflection control strategy and then part of that is i'm just going to make the low end a little bit better by hanging broadband deep absorbers in the corners just to reduce the amplitude of these changes to me that still feels like a good place to start for the average person in the average room relative to them going through the process of tuning room and putting um targeted absorbers in there that said for anyone who's super serious about audio and wants to properly tune a room tuned absorbers should be part of that equation. But I don't know if that's every single person yeah, listening I mean, to this the, conversation the, and buying $500 to $800 speakers. The analogy I would use is getting reading glasses from CVS versus going and seeing an optometrist. Sure. Um, uh, you know, just go see an optometrist <laughs> and see what <laughs> your problem is. And sure, I mean, if you only need this to read every once in a while, this is fine and it and it is a viable solution. Um, I... I have, I have been in so many rooms where even if the intention was, oh, I'm just going to put some stuff up in the corners to calm down a little stuff, it's just bad. Um, and it's just it just doesn't work. Um, and seriously, a measurement microphone is $100. Um, sure. You're going to spend at least two or $300 on each of those absorbers. Go buy a microphone first and figure out what's going on in your room. Fair enough. Icy says, my situation, two subs and mains on stands um stereo is two 18 inch subs with coaxial 12 inch horns i'm sorry i say i'm not sure if i totally understand this question <coughs> i'm having trouble with it if you want to try to rewrite it i'm just having trouble uh wrap my head around it uh jimmy says how do you feel about software like ik multimedia uh arc 3 or sonar works um, like those kinds of room correction softwares yeah, so Sonarworks, we had a great conversation with Sonarworks a few months ago because what we uh, advocate, especially for an Atmos system, um, and that, look, we're talking at that point about someone whose job it is to make Atmos productions uh, at a high level. Um, so that might not necessarily be the case for somebody who's setting up a, a stereo home studio. Um, we really advocate uh, someone who knows how to take a measurement going in and taking a full measurement and understanding those measurements and then going in and applying EQ based on that. Um, Sonarworks has an automated system and what they said is what you guys are doing is hiring a photographer with a DSLR to take and edit a picture. What we are doing is giving the user an iPhone and some nice AI to make a good looking picture and I love that analogy. Um, for 90% of users, the iPhone is going to be enough. Um, for the professional user, for something where it's really mission critical, the, tr the translation is dead on, you need the professional with the professional tool set. Um, Sonarworks works super great. Um, 
uh, I'm not sure what the curve that uh, IK Multimedia's ARC3 is targeting um, is, uh, but I have seen some measurements and some of the corrections it's trying to apply. And I can say based on that, that if I were choosing between that and Sonarworks, I would choose Sonarworks every time. Interesting. All right. Good stuff. Well, <coughs> we're, I think uh, we have a few more questions coming in, but I said that Jimmy would get the last one. So that's it. Um, it was really great to have you guys on here. Um, definitely check out Cali over at CaliAudio.com. Um, I totally believe that they make some of the best sounding speakers at their price point that dramatic that can outperform speakers that are cost substantially more. Um, they're totally one of your best options out there. I particularly am partial to the IN series. I really like three-way speaker designs and I really like coaxial speaker designs and I just haven't seen any other company make those design considerations as affordable and high performance as Cali has. So total vote of confidence for me. Big vote of confidence as well from Jeff Ellis, who did a recent masterclass with uh, us. You can see he's won multiple you know, Grammys and had um, you know, multi-platinum selling records now working on the IN uh, series of monitors. So really tremendous stuff. And thanks so much for sharing your thoughts about subwoofers, rooms, speaker design, all that stuff. Nate, just really great to have you on. Um, yeah, any, thanks uh, so much. Yeah, any last, oh, oh, right now you guys have a sale on your INUNFs. Anything else that people should know about or any other places that they should follow you? Yeah, we have we have two sales going on. We have a sale on get a WS6.2 with a pair of LP8s for a reduced price and get a WS6.2 with an INUNF for a reduced price. We also have a sale going on on our MVBT, which is a handy little way to get Bluetooth into your uh, professional audio signal chain. Um, that's usually 120. It's going for $99 right now. Um, if you have questions in general, uh, I like to say that we have the best customer service department in pro audio. Um, go on our website and submit a ticket and um, someone very friendly will get in touch and do their best to answer your questions for you um, and reach out anytime. We're happy to talk to you. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. I'm so sorry that there's two or three more new questions that have come in that we won't get to this time. But if you want to bring them up, uh, we do have a Q&A session, a live Q&A session that we do every month for YouTube members. So if you want guaranteed answers to all of your questions, check out our live Q&A uh, option. Uh, just click the join button if you're here on YouTube. <coughs> and uh, we have the regular Q&As where you get guaranteed answers to all of them. And hope that's useful to you. Thanks again, Nate, for hanging out with us. Thanks for being a sponsor of MixCon. Oh, and enter the MixCon Mega Giveaway if you haven't already. We're giving away some Cali Audio subwoofers in there and uh, about $12,000 worth of free gear. There's a link in the description and here in the chat box. Thanks for hanging out with me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop with Nate Baglios of Cali Audio. See you next time. <laughs>